Last time we left off with me having visited three different field sites and choosing a Vindo National Park. This had a large bay in it, a clearing in the forest. It was called Langue Bay, and it is so beautiful. There are lots of elephants there. I was so excited to get my research started in that park. So after we went to Congo and Gabon, I went back to Missouri, Columbia, Missouri, um, where I went to school at the University of Missouri. And the next steps were to get funding to um, so that we could afford the project so I could pay for my stay there, um, any field equipment, and of course the genetic samples. We needed permits to work in the park as well. So I started working on both of those things right away. For funding, we looked at a lot of different grants out there. And uh, my advisor was also um, new faculty at the time, so she did have some startup funds, um, but she was uh, um, writing some large National Science Foundation grants, and if she got them, my project would have been funded through it. Uh, I, was, I was writing a graduate research fellowship uh, program proposal, um, and this is an NSF program, the National Science Foundation. And um, this is awarded to uh, graduate students who, and it, it's early career graduate students, so those who have yet to go to graduate school or, or those um, who are in, I believe you can apply just after your first year and then, then, it's, and then it's done after that. If you are applying for this or thinking about applying this, um, I actually am having, a, I have a new service out there. I, I did this for, for free for one of my students in my Confusion to Clarity course. And I honestly have a really fun time doing it. And I was like, I should, I should do pe this. I should help people with this. So um, one of my new services, I'm not sure when it's gonna be on my website, but you can just reach out to me, is that I will professionally review your graduate research fellowship. Um, proposal or program. I can't remember what the P stands for. Okay, anyways, I'm getting flustered. <laughs> okay, so I was working on funding, um, so is my advisor. Um, the one big grant outside of the National Science Foundation that we applied for was through the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Now, for grants, there's a lot of really big grants, like the National Science Foundation, which awards grants usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, or um, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, up to millions of dollars. And then there's a lot of grants that are... Um, that are you know, useful and extremely helpful, um, but not that that large. Um, so more in the thousands of dollars. And usually I would say most of them are 10,000 or less. Um, and then there's some that are in the mid range. Those are pretty few and far between now. And um, this is the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Now the US Fish and Wildlife Service is, is pretty cool um, as a resource if you're studying elephants because they have a whole division um, or special category for uh, elephants. I believe it's, um, they might even have separate ones for African and Asian elephants, I can't remember. But the United States um, government sets aside money to research several endangered species even though they don't live in the United States and um, those include elephants. So I co-wrote a grant. I honestly wrote a lot of it, most of it, um, and I did this with my advisor, but my advisor had to submit the grant. I wasn't allowed to because I wasn't a, a PI or a principal, a principal investigator at this point in my life. Um, you need a, a PhD to be a PI, um, or you just need to be the head of your lab. So uh, um, we wrote all these grants, and um, we got a lot of no's, but luckily we got one yes, and that was with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we were able to get our funding. I don't remember what year it was in my uh, graduate school experience, um, but I want to say year two or year three. So I was writing that, and then at the same time, I was also writing a research permit to get started in a Vindo National Park. And the thing about Gabon is that it's a French-speaking country. And the thing about me is that I took Spanish in high school because I was like, when am I ever gonna use Latin, and when am I ever gonna use French? 
Well, it turns out French and Latin would have been really useful in my career. French because of the obvious reason with my field season and Latin to help me with scientific names of animals. Anyway, I didn't do this. Um, so I had to learn enough French to be able to write a research proposal, to be able to talk to people. And I am not a language pe person. Sometimes people can go to other countries and they just pick up the language. Um, so I was in Kenya for a year and we had students, they weren't officially trained in Swahili. I think they had maybe several lessons and some of them asked for informal sessions from the staff members, but students left there speaking a key Swahili. Me, I was there for a year. I couldn't do it. I just, I, I mean, I, I honestly didn't try that hard. I didn't spend a lot of time doing it, but I'm just not a language person. I don't pick it up. I'm, I'm not a, an audio, audio learner. Um, it's really hard. I remember even in school, it was really hard for me to um, answer questions after listening to a paragraph. I'm much more visual. I like to see things on paper. So in terms of writing, actually, writing wasn't too bad for me. I, um, and especially with Google Translate, Google Translate was really, really helpful. So um, honestly, I took a lot of what I wrote in English and I put it in um, Google Translate and I used it as a starting point to translate and then I tried to correct as best as I could the grammar and at the end I had it overlooked by uh, uh, somebody who spoke French and they and they proofread it. So I was working on my permits and about halfway through working on my permits I received this email from I think it was maybe the head of Wildlife Conservation Society, Gabon, and Wildlife Conservation Society, I can't remember if they owned the site or not, but they had a huge presence in Avindo. And I received, I received this email that I would not be allowed to work in that park again, or not again, I wouldn't be allowed to work in that park. My heart sank. Um, I just, I felt like, my my field work is already problematic before it even started. I already have to pivot and change plans. So I talked with my advisor and we both agreed that Lope National Park would be the next best thing. We, we thought that Odzala was still um, too difficult to access and Lope seemed to have more elephants, um, or not necessarily more elephants, but it was easier to see the elephants in the park. So I rewrote my uh, permits to include Lope. Of course, we corresponded with the field station director to make sure that it was still possible. And um, I was gonna have to change my plans a little bit because before I was going to sit on a platform and um, and watch elephants from the platform at this large buy. Um, and Lope didn't have a large buy, so I needed to adjust. The other thing that I started planning for is to obtain blood samples from the elephants that I was studying in Luongo National Park. I received satellite telemetry data from a colleague of ours and I was analyzing their spatial patterns. And I really wanted to see if individuals who overlapped more were more closely related to each other. So at the time, the Wildlife Conservation Society took um, blood samples and put them on filter paper. And um, we um, and they said we could use them for non-invasive genetic analysis, or I guess it's invasive because they're blood samples. Um, Anyway, so a part of my mission in Gabon was to find these blood samples. And they, they were at this time, I don't remember how old, but things just, you know, sometimes things just get lost. So I honestly didn't have a lot of hope that I would get these blood samples, but I really wanted them because I knew it would make my um, paper so much stronger. And at the end of Lope, I was also going to visit Luongo National Park because I wanted to have two different field sites. That would be ideal, uh, ideal so that I, I could um, really see if the patterns were not just specific to one population and rather uh, characteristic of forest elephants. 
Finally, I had all my stuff together and I was ready to go. So I had a trip scheduled in 2008. And at this time, I was in my third year of my PhD. I was kind of freaking out a little bit because lots of other students had already had at least one, some had two field seasons under their belt and therefore um, two data sets to work with. I had nothing, I had no data. Well, I guess I had the, the telemetry data, but I had nothing for my other chapters. So I was, I felt a little bit um, behind because I went so late. Um, some people in their PhDs, if you have like a lab-based PhD, some people can finish in four or five years. At our university, it was more like six or seven years for ecology students. But um, I went in my third year and I did the best that I could. So Lope National Park, we, we stayed at the field station in the northeastern part of the park. It is surrounded by savanna habitats and there are forests along rivers and there's also these little um, forests, what they call bosques. And these are little, they're like patches of forest surrounded by savannas. So this is what the northeastern part of the park is like and then the rest is a solid forest. So when I first started in Lope, the first thing we had to do was find a buy that I could observe from and build a platform at. So I went with the field assistant. We went to all these different sites um, with, with buys and um, looked to see how, um, how likely it would be or how, how um, how good it would possibly be to serve as a buy for me to observe elephants. Potential, that's what I'm working, looking the word for. That's what we're looking for. Um, how much potential did the buy have? A lot of the buys in Lope, actually all of the buys in Lope are small, like really small compared to Langue buy. So Langue buy, um, it's like football fields long, whereas Lope, um, maybe like a couple hundred meters long for the bigger ones. Um, so honestly, it was a little bit disheartening at first. It didn't feel like I was ever gonna find the right location. But then we went to this one um, location. It actually wasn't a buy, it was a riverbed, but we had to take a, a short walk through the forest and in Lope, you have to be extremely careful entering the forest because forest elephants in this park are notorious for being aggressive. Actually, the two parks that I wanted to work in, Lope and Luongo, the forest elephants are, are infamous for being aggressive. In Lope, there, there was a situation where um, people were trying to um, flush animals out of a bosque um, so that they could get some diversity count and somebody um, didn't run when they saw it, when an elephant was coming towards them. Um, so they came across, uh, I believe it was a young male elephant and they didn't run. You should always run with elephants. Um, they say that they do false charges. Their, their first charge is always false, but I just don't like to take that risk. So always run. And this girl, um, she, she um, just panicked and she um, kneeled down and um, like crouched and put her hands over her head and the elephant gored her. Now she was okay, but I mean, she had tusk through her body. That is a scary situation. There's also other stories in Lope. Another story that I heard is that um, one of the long-term re long researchers there, um, there's a lot of um, chimpanzee and gorilla work at Lope actually. Um, that's one of their, their primary research focuses are primates. And um, one day, this woman came across elephants, the elephants charged her. And normally when elephants charge you, they, they're, you know, they're not carnivores, they're not predators, so they're not looking to like eat you. Um, they mostly are just like are annoyed by you and want you out of the way. So, you know, she ran, she got out of the way, but these elephants weren't having it. And um, they, they followed her and she hiked for kilometers and they followed her and she had to keep her pace up and, um, and kind of out walk, outrun these elephants. And I'm sure, you know, as you can probably imagine humans can't really do this. 
And she came to an area where um, there was a cliff and she couldn't do it anymore. So she got, she um, went on this rock and um, the elephant was actually using its trunk to like get her, like get her feet. And she had to like jump over the trunk. This is, this is the story I heard, um, which is crazy. Like why would, why would these elephants do that? And the thing that saved her is she just didn't know what to do and she started making chimpanzee calls. And um, the elephants, they then went away when she, when she made chimpanzee calls. Um, so, so everyone in the forest, all the field assistants, um, were really careful entering the forest and walking through the forest because elephants and forest buffalo um, are real and dangerous. So as we were walking down this trail, we had to stop because my field assistant heard something. And um, we stopped, waited for a bit, and then I saw something. I saw some rustling. And we had come across um, an elephant, I believe it was one, maybe two, that was actually visiting the location where I wanted to set up my platform. What a sign. I was so happy. It was just so cool to see that. I was able to get some pictures, um, although it was hard because uh, we weren't in the, exactly the most open area. But to me, this was a sign that that this is going to work out for me, that this is gonna be an excellent spot to build a platform. So that day we couldn't go because the elephants were there. Um, we had to wait till they completely left the area. But um, we came back the following day and saw fresh elephant dung and we saw old elephant dung. And like I said, even though this wasn't a buy, it was a riverbed on the bank, you could see that elephants had dug their tusks in the bank to um, consume the minerals that are rich in the soil. So it had a lot of the same characteristics of a buy. Step two then after we found the location was to figure out where to build a platform. So in um, Langway Bay, they had this giant platform with like multiple levels. It was really stable. That's how Zanga Bay is too. But Gabon is actually a really expensive country to work in. They import a lot of stuff. So the prices are actually very similar to um, how much things cost in the United States. So to make such a complicated platform would have been very expensive. We needed to look for a tree that had a branch um, nestled into it um, where we could place a platform. So that's what we did. We found a tree and we found um, this large uh, deuterium tree, really large. It was the only one that would work. And we had to put the platform up, I kid you not, like 60 feet in the in, high in the tree. Um, so about 20 meters. And this tree was like straight up. Um, I've never been afraid of heights. I've never been one to be afraid of heights. Um, but, well, I'll tell you once I once <laughs> we finished the platform, um, I did not realize how high it was until I got up there. So for the next week, we started construction. We hired a, a local carpenter and he um, he got all the wood and, and a local team of um, younger younger boys to help out and they built a ladder going up to the platform and this this carpenter was amazing I think he was in his 60s um, and he was just so agile and um, so fit going up that tree and like here I am I can't I could never do something like that. Therefore, we built the platform. He built a single um, space. It was probably like six feet by six feet, um, so just as long as my body. And um, we had a little, um, we had a, a barrier uh, so that I wouldn't fall out. We had, we had um, uh, an edge, a railing, so that I, I, I had something to hold on to. And then we had um, some wooden planks overhead so that we could create a protective um, um, area with with tarp with plastic tarp um, to protect me from rain and the weather so the first time I went up this tree I remember that 
you know, I thought, I don't know, I just think of like climbing a ladder as like not being that hard, but I had to use my upper body strength to pull myself up. That was how straight this tree was. One time I looked down halfway, halfway climbing up or down, I can't remember, and I was like, never do that again. <laughs> Don't look down. So I had to use a lot of strength to climb um, myself up. I remembered my hands and arms shaking. Once I got up there though, it was so freaking cool. It was just amazing to be on that platform in the middle of the forest and um, just like disappear in into into the forest sounds and um, and just and just watch to see what happens. So. I, every day, the field assistants would take me to my platform. So we'd leave in the morning, they would walk me down the trail, they would leave me for the day, and then um, a couple of, like an hour or so before sunset, they would come and get me and um, walk me back up. So I spent all day alone on this platform. I remember the first day I was so excited. I thought I was gonna see like so many cool animals. Um, from the dung, I thought I was gonna see elephants like all the time. So I was just like sitting there waiting with my field guides, waiting with my notebooks, ready to take um, notes about elephants. I had all my camera gear, I was ready. And then I got on the platform and I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. One of the things I really remember well is um, there's an insect, I think they're flies, but they're called sweat bees. And they're not um, like bees here in the United States. They don't sting you, but they get in your face. They just like, they just like, they're really, they just like stick to you. So some days I remember just like them like coming on my face and just not leaving my face. And like sometimes you can't even see cause they're all in your eyes. So some days were so bad like that. But for the most part, I just sat there and waited. And it was really cool to be high in the trees, um, but I thought, like I said, I was gonna see so many different animals. And so often it was so quiet. Even the birds, they were difficult to see because I was in the midst of the canopy. It was cool to see the high canopy birds at, at, at eye level. Every time I heard crashing, I was like, this, this, these are elephants, they are coming. But I was disappointed, it was always monkeys. Not that I don't love to see monkeys, but remember, I came here to get data on elephants and to see elephants. A couple of times I saw an animal called a diker. They're an ungulate. They're, um, they're kind of, they're, they're smaller than deer, but they're kind of stocky. Um, so, so one day or a couple of days we had, um, it was a yellow backed d diker that was there, but that was all that I saw for mammals, monkeys and the diker, and then, um, some birds. But one day, after days and days and days of sitting on the platform, I think I had a whole week, I got what I came for. And it was actually really quiet, and suddenly, not, well I guess it wasn't suddenly, it, it gradually, the noise increased, and I looked down and there were just elephants there. And it was just so cool because I'd been staring at this, this ri river bank forever and there was nothing there and then all of a sudden there are elephants there. So it was a female elephant and her calf and um, it was an older calf and they just went around the by looking, or went around the river bank looking for, for, looking for fruits, looking for forage and um, it's hanging out there for quite a long time. I think it was one, maybe two hours. They definitely um, ingested some of the soil. They, they dug up some of the bank. Um, and I watched them for this entire time and they didn't know I was there. Because elephants in this park, when they sense that there are humans around, they um, stick their trunk up like, a, like above. So, um, if you imagine how some people portray elephants like underwater with their, with a snorkel, like their trunk acting as a snorkel, it kind of looks like that. Obviously they're not underwater, but <laughs> they stick their trunk high into the air and they smell 
um, to, to confirm that there's humans in the area. And they didn't act like this at all. They just acted uh, just elephant-y is how, how you would expect elephants to be. While this was happening, I did have in the back of my head, what if these elephants never leave? <laughs> what, if, what if when my field assistants come, they don't leave and I therefore can't get down off the platform and I would have to stay overnight on the platform by myself? And that does sound really cool. And although we had a railing, we did not, though, have like a solid um, border. So I started like panicking and thinking about all these like worst case scenarios of me falling asleep on the platform and falling off, rolling off in my sleep. And um, what would I, yeah, what would I do? What would I do if it rained? Luckily, though, the elephants eventually did leave, and when my field assistants came, they um, were able to pick me up and take me back safely to the field station. Now, this was rough, being on this platform. I did this for about, I think, two weeks, every day, for hours on end, each day, and I only saw African forest elephants once. So if I was there, I was there for about four months each time, do the math, I would not have enough elephants to be able to conduct network analyses if this represents the pattern of elephants going to that riverbank. So we had to change plans and change plans quick because I was losing um, time from, from the field. So... I talked with the field station director and once again I had to pivot my research and this made me so sad because we spent money and so much effort went into building this platform but unfortunately it just it just wasn't working out and um, we had to change plans for my research I was running at the time so from there on I decided to study elephants by um, navigating through the park driving. So what my new plan was um, is that I woke up early in the morning before, before sunrise. I got ready in the dark before the generator was turned on. I made coffee in the dark. I always needed coffee. And I um, got the car and I started driving around the forest when the sun was up, as the sun rose. I had to learn, here was another challenge, I had to learn driving stick shift in French. <laughs> My teachers, for the most part, were French. Um, I did have one English speaker there, but um, she had a lot of her other work that she had to do. So a lot of times the field assistants who could drive were, were teaching me how to do this. And the reason why I couldn't have a field assistant with me is because they all lived in Lope Town, which is um, like, I think it was like 20 minutes, 30 minutes away by car. Um, and none of them have a car, so there was always a shuttle, um, one of the cars that we use to pick up the... Um, pick up the staff, and then drive them back to the field station every day. So I had to go in the morning all by myself. And in the beginning, this was scary because the elephants are aggressive in this park. Um, but I eventually got used to it, and I actually really liked it. Um, some some things definitely still scared me though the the fact that I could get stuck the roads were very muddy some of them were you couldn't even um, pass them there's just one road I remember in particular it was so deteriorated that we couldn't even go on it um, so I did I did worry about that I have to tell you a funny driving story actually I just thought of this when I was learning to drive, at, before you enter Lope Town, there is this, this um, road that curves and then you enter the bridge. And I swear to you, the bridge is as wide as the car is. And you have to get your wheels on these planks where, where the wheels are supposed to go. And the one day when I was practicing driving, I was driving the staff back to Lope Town. 
and we were ready to turn on the bridge and I was nervous. I knew they knew that I was nervous and they made me stop the car and they got out of the car <laughs> before I drove over the bridge. It was so funny actually. I was laughing hysterically and um, I remember uh, one of the women who worked at the field station was laughing hysterically. She loved it. Um, I made it over the bridge, though. I was successful. I did a good job. Um, but it was, that bridge always, always scared me. So, um, so yeah, so I looked for elephants every morning and then also evening. Now, elephants can be active really any time of the day, but um, we seemed to see them most in the mornings and the later afternoons. Um, and then also my, my time was limited by my budget because I had to pay for fuel for the car. So we maximized the most important data collection periods in um, the morning and the afternoon. Um, so from there on, I changed my strategy to driving around the park. Whenever I would see an elephant, I would stop, take as many pictures as I could first. I had, before I started my research, I had these visions where I would be, just like just like how I explained with the Ambicelli research assistant, where I would be standing by the vehicle, stopping looking at an elephant, taking my binoculars, and looking through my elephant cards that had um, detailed information on them, on, on their, um, their tusk shape and their ear tears, and I would look up and be like, that is tuskless C. That was one of the elephants in the park. No, that did not happen at all. A lot of times the elephants heard the car or started to smell it and they ran into the forest right before I even got to take any pictures of them. If they did cooperate, often they were moving so fast or they were hidden by a lot of vegetation. They were like weaving in and out of vegetation. I couldn't get a good look at them. Even if I could, the way that we told these elephants apart was by their tusk shape and length, by um, their tail brush pattern, and their ear tears. Ear, then these elephants don't get ear tears like savanna elephants do. And so, savanna elephants, they live in this really dry, thorny environment that um, literally tears away at their ears. Um, and if they're males, they fight as well, so that gets them ear tears. But in forest elephants, most of the elephants don't have them, or they have these like tiny, tiny ones that it's hard to tell if it's like, like a natural variation in the ear or if it's a real tear. Um, and then if there's vegetation blocking it, it's problematic. So I started to identify the elephants a lot by their ear vein patterns and their tusk, um, tusk length and shape using those two combinations of, of strategies. So whenever I saw elephants, I took as many pictures as I could, and then I quickly got hundreds and hundreds of pictures. I was overwhelmed with elephants. Even sitting down and starting to identify them back at the field station was extremely time consuming that I eventually had to bring that work with me um, back to Missouri. And, and um, later I can talk about, talk about how I sorted through those elephants. So um, this is the strategy that I switched to, and in retrospect, I am actually really grateful that a window didn't work out because I had to get dung samples from these elephants. So after I saw the elephants, I would go back. And again, my visions and my perfect visions, I imagined I'd be watching them and then see them move into the forest, and then maybe come back an hour later and they wouldn't be there and it would be safe to go in and look for their dung. But no, these elephants, once they found a place, they stuck there for like hours and hours and hours. So for the most part, I had to come back. If I saw them in the morning, well, obviously later in the morning, the field assistants. Um, but a lot of times I saw elephants in the evening and we had to come back in the morning with field assistants to look for fresh dung samples. So I'm gonna stop there for today. And next time, we are going to talk about collecting the dung samples, um, what it's like to work with elephant dung and genetics, more field work stories, because this was only just one part of my field work. And I also have to tell you my elephant interaction stories. Um, 
One of them is a first for the field station. It's the first time this ever happened to anyone. So you don't want to miss out. Um, so make sure you subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to YouTube. I'm also filming this on YouTube so that you can make sure you hear my forest elephant story. Thank you guys um, so much for listening. And um, I hope to see you soon.